Welcome to the Capital News. I'm your host, Alex Kreitas. Today is Monday, July 27th, 2020. Thank you so much for joining me. Hope you enjoyed your weekend. The title of today's podcast, A Week of More. And we already are kicking off with the Republican version of another trillion-dollar monstrosity in addition to the Nobody Cares Act. I guess this is going to be the Nobody Cares Act Jr. Another trillion dollars that we don't have. It's going to be made up through funny money. Finally, the Republicans are attempting to put out the appearance that they have grown a spine, that the debts and the deficits are completely out of control. But hey, we can compromise with another trillion dollars that we don't have to fill an ever-growing hole. We'll talk about that slightly. This week, as I had stated last week, is supposed to be the release, the first release of the second quarter GDP figure. This is going to be history in the making. This is just going to be devastating. And of course, estimates are all over the place. They have been for the past few months, anywhere from a negative 30% to perhaps negative 60%. We saw that close, some of those predictions, and that was by the Federal Reserve. Some of those second quarter GDP figures. So we'll get that out hopefully this week as well. Last week I did state that I wanted to talk about the money supply a little bit. Got off on a little bit of a tangent last week, so I did not touch on that. I want to make sure that we get to that today just so you have some perspective. I'm going to put perspective on a lot of things here in this podcast because it's important because it shows how crazy everything is. A trillion dollars. We're throwing it around like it's nothing. We're throwing a trillion dollars around like it's candy. A trillion dollars. Again, we'll put that into some perspective. 12 million Americans missed their rent payments in the month of June. I'll repeat. 12 million Americans missed their rent payments in the month of June. This is catastrophic. This is a this is a tragedy. Then we got some data out for the first week of July. The first week of July, some 19% of renters did not make a payment at all for the first week of July. 19% of renters did not pay anything towards rent. And then some 13% paid a portion. Now, This number is an uptick from the first week of June. So this is not the trajectory we want to see. You want to be able to see more people paying their rent. And again, we talked about the insolvencies when it comes to business. It's insolvencies at the household level too. We talked about the evictions. Estimates from 20 to 28 million Americans can be kicked out. Again, for a little perspective, during the depths of the great financial crisis, which at its heart and core was a real estate bust, 10 million Americans were evicted. 10 million versus now estimates of 20 to 28 million. This is heartbreaking. But what are you going to do? How many more moratoriums are they going to extend? The federal government only has jurisdiction on federal loans, anything that might be backed by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. Well, that's not the entire mortgage sector. And what are you going to do with rent? What are the landlords going to do? What are the developers of those properties going to do? Because it's not as if they actually own them, most of them. Anyway, in that case, they have a mortgage. And if they're not able to service their paper, Well, then guess what? The bank's going to come in and foreclose on those property owners, on those developers, on those landlords. And it's going to get very hairy because there's a lot of people out there say, you know, no job, no rent. You know, they think, a lot of people unfortunately think that their landlords might actually own the property. Free and clear that there's no mortgage on it, that there's no loan against it, nothing. That they're just some rich multimillionaire who just happens to own the property and they're just collecting rent month after month, sitting back and laughing and smoking cigars. That's not the case, folks. 
How many middle class Americans buy another property to get another stream of cash flow coming in? They have a mortgage. That's why they need people to rent because they got to service that mortgage. And then they hope over the 10, 20, 15, whatever, 30 years, they pay off the mortgage. They own the property free and clear. And now it's just a nice stream of income for them in their retirement. Or maybe they'll take the equity, go out, purchase another home, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. That's the situation across this country. So how much longer are they going to be able to hold out? I don't think much longer. And that's why it's crunch time for these politicians to come up with something else. Now, they don't have to. They can come out and tell us the truth. They can come out and tell us about sacrifices that need to be made, that this system is unsustainable. They could say that this is a Ponzi scheme. They're never going to do any of this. So they're going to conjure up another trillion dollars out of nowhere because we don't have it. Is it going to be another $1,200 stimulus check? Is it going to be an extension of the $600, maybe $200? Again, this has to go back and forth to the House. They got to pass something. And remember, Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats wanted another three, three and a half trillion. At least they don't care. At least the Democrats are in your face about it. At least they're honest about it. Here's the money. We want three trillion, three and a half trillion. Let's just keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. The Republicans, on the other hand, they would have you believe that they are fiscally conservative, that they actually care or give a damn about the debt and deficit. Trillion dollar deficit before COVID-19, as we said was going to be the case because of their tax cuts of how that worked, because they didn't cut spending. Again, I want taxes gone. I want the income tax abolished. All right, you're not going to get a bigger proponent here. But you have to cut spending. It's basic math. Otherwise, you're going to end up running deficits. And they were so big, you got a trillion dollar deficit. And again, don't forget this because this was before COVID-19. Now we're on track to hit $4 trillion and a national deficit just for fiscal year 2020 alone. And I imagine it'll be worse than that. And we still got a couple months to go. The end of September will be the conclusion of fiscal year 2020. But the Republicans, again, they want to play both sides of it. Again, our podcast, 96 to nothing. No votes for America. That was the Senate. It was just as bad in the House. They all lined up, again, like I've been stating over the past couple of weeks, a, an email from my congressman. Where do you want the money to go? There was no option that said, uh, how about you stop altogether? No more bailouts. This is not going to end well. This is not how you do it. Why don't you say, can we, how about we cut some spending? No, that wasn't even an option. How much more do you want to spend? Those are the only questions we are getting. Because this is a banana republic, don't you know? Democrats, yeah, keep it going. Three trillion, three and a half, twenty trillion, who cares? Republicans, yep, we're going to sign off on the Nobody Cares Act. Three trillion here, another trillion over there. And now all of a sudden, we're concerned about the debt and deficit. I'm not buying it. Sorry, just not going to buy into it. A lot of things to digest. I don't know how this is all going to play out. Nobody does. They're making it up as they go. In this country, around the world, central bankers... It's, it's all a big game. That's why you have to be diversified. That's why you got to look at what they're doing. You got to get into hard assets. You got to get into something real, something tangible, something that actually means something. All of this paper that they're throwing out there, all of this, all of these dollars that they're creating out of thin air, they're going out of style. You cannot reasonably think that you can do this as a country and that there's not going to be any type of negative downstream effects. They're coming. They're already here. What they are doing is prolonging the agony. They are prolonging the natural corrective forces of a market. This is exactly what they did, just with now trillions of dollars instead of billions, this is exactly what they did, 1920s, 1930s, that turned a recession into the Great Depression. Well, this is going to be the greatest depression. Back then, you had a lot of tailwinds. You had a lot of demographics working in our favor. You had a lot of tailwinds back then. Today, not so much. Demographics are terrible. We got a government that's completely out of control. We have one Ponzi scheme after the next throughout our government. We didn't have to deal with that junk, with that mess, 
80 years ago. We do today. And it's only going to get worse with 10,000 baby boomers reaching the age of 65 on a daily basis. The entitlement programs, the entitlement system in this country, the social welfare, the corporate welfare that exists in this country is bringing us to our knees and nobody is saying enough is enough. Nobody wants to talk about them because everybody's afraid of losing votes. They're afraid of losing their big corporate donors. They're afraid of losing older Americans who actually go out and vote because, well, you can't take away my Social Security. You can't reduce my benefits. You can't take away my Medicare. You can't reduce my benefits. You're never going to get voted in because nobody's going to sacrifice because everybody's say, oh, I paid into this system for 40 years. Yeah, you paid into a Ponzi system for 40 years. Do you get it? No, nope, let's just keep putting it off, putting it off. Let's just kick the can. Let's put it on our children, our grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Let them deal with it. And that's exactly what's happening. That's why so many college students can't find jobs. You see how this is all connected? You see how much growth was brought forward from the future because of all of this debt? Debt does not equal growth. Debt kills growth. So how can we be accelerating? How can we be stimulating the economy if what we're putting out into the economy kills growth? I mean, I like to use the analogy of an Olympic sprinter running the 100 meter. He's in tip-top condition. If you hit him with some juice, you gave him some stimulus. Well, our economy, if you're going to say it's analogous to that Olympic sprinter, no, no, no. No, no. A couple mob guys took us behind a building and broke both our legs. We can't run. We can't even walk. We got a trouble crawling. And the government's idea is, well, let's, get, let's hit him with some juice. We can't even walk. We're not going to be able to make it 100 meters down. That's not how this works. We're going to end up killing the patient. That's exactly what is taking place right now. Believe me when I tell you. Take no pleasure in saying it. But you cannot conjure up trillions of dollars out of thin air and expect everything to be perfect. Because if that's the case, if there are no negative consequences to this, nobody has to pay taxes anymore. You don't have to pay your bills anymore. Government can beg, borrow, steal. Federal Reserve can print the money and everybody's taken care of. And the other thing that's really disheartening too in all of this, and this is just a symptom of the system and a, the symptom of the times. Let's say for the sake of argument that they found the unicorn with a rainbow wrapped around its neck. They found the free lunch. They can print up trillions of dollars, no negative side effects whatsoever, okay? For the sake of argument. What are they doing with that money? Oh, well, they're bailing out a government that's broke. They're bailing out state governments that are broke. Uh, they're buying up corporate debt of the largest corporations, not just in the United States, but in the world. Mm-hmm. What about people starving to death? And any, anything for that? Any, any type of major environmental cleanup, any type of grand investment in some type of water desalination, hmm? any great infrastructure projects underway here, eradication of diseases that can't be eradicated. People are starving to death. We're buying corporate debt from Apple and Amazon and Verizon and AT&T and Volkswagen. Do we have our priorities straight? Do you understand why people are rioting and protesting and will soon be overthrowing their governments or attempting to do so? And I'm not saying it's right to print the money and do that stuff, but I'm saying if we're going to print the money and we're going to be told that there's no negative side effects to this, the president, Larry Kudlow, Stephen Mnuchin, Jay Powell, Ben Bernanke, Janet Yellen, oh, the whole lot of them. And a whole bunch of idiots on CNBC and Bloomberg and Fox Business, all of them. No negative side of it. This is what needs to be done. They're saving the system. That's how we prioritize. That's where we give the money. That's where we throw it out to. 
Jeff Bezos, like we talked about last week, he added $13 billion to his net worth. I think that happened in a day because Amazon stock price shot up big. No news either, by the way. It's not like it was an earnings beat or he revolutionized another technology or was awarded big contracts. No, no, just, just, just because. Because we are printing trillions of dollars and it has to find its way somewhere. I don't demonize wealth. I demonize fraud and abuse and counterfeit. That's the world we live in. How many people could have benefited from $13 billion? Did Jeff Bezos need an additional $13 billion? Again, people starving to death. How much money could have been sent to children's hospitals, cancer research, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So many things more noble than buying corporate debt of the world's largest corporations. See a mom and pop, see a little restaurant, bye-bye. You don't lobby, you do not pass go. It's a banana republic, folks. How much more evidence do you need? Market performance, stocks were up today. Of course, the NASDAQ was the biggest leader. No surprise, they're up 1.7% right now in overnight futures trading. We have the Dow Jones Industrial Average flat. The S&P 500 is up about one-tenth of 1%. 1 the NASDAQ 100 is gaining another one-half of 1%. 1 the, the Japanese market cash trade right now uh, is relatively flat, but down about uh, one-tenth of 1%. 1 Across the pond in Europe today, a mixed bag, mostly in the red. Biggest loser was the Spanish markets, down 1.7%. Cash trade in Australia right now, also flat, but slightly in the green, up about one-tenth of 1%. 1 and the Chinese markets are also trading in the green, up about six-tenths of 1%. On the commodity front, we have WTI trading at $41.54 a barrel. Brent is at $43.46 and natural gas at $1.72. Another big day for gold and silver. A couple percentage point move to the upside for gold. Several percentage point move to the upside for silver. However, right now, both spot prices are trading back. They're giving a little bit of that back. Gold is right now trading at $1,943 an ounce. Silver is at $24.59 an ounce. Slightly before I started this podcast, you actually had the futures price of silver flirting with $26 an ounce. $26 an ounce. But again, right now, giving some of that back on the spot price, $24.60. To me, this is no surprise, and it's actually a healthy thing if you're actually going to witness a breakout to the upside in the precious metals space. We have seen a lot of things go parabolic. Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Tesla is a prime example. Healthy breakouts, you're going to see these types of pullbacks. I would rather see, obviously, a strong day up and then a little bit of a pullback as opposed to it just continuously going up, up, up and away. Because that, to me, is more of a sign of a coming and looming blow-off top. But if you go up and you come back and you go up and you come back and you go up, that, to me, is a sign of a healthier functioning market. And with all of the money printing that's going on around the world, with all of the geopolitical risks and uncertainties, with all of the economic realities that we are aware of, a lot of the things that we talked about just at the top of this podcast, that we know are coming down the pike, people are flocking to safer havens. They view gold and silver as a safer haven asset, and rightly so, because for centuries, thousands and thousands of years, mankind has selected and continuously elected, elected and elected again, gold and silver to be a monetary metal. That's what they are. And when you're printing money like it's going out of style, because it is, people are going to flock back to what works. The pendulum has swung too far in one direction and it is starting to make its way back. That's why I've been stating here consistently for quite a while that we are in the midst of a long-term bull market when it comes to the precious metals space. One of the only things that can reverse this is if there is true leadership and true honesty from governments around the world that are going to reverse course and say we have to sacrifice, we have to strengthen the dollar, we have to strengthen all these other currencies 
they're not going to do that. They're not going to do that. They got to keep the Ponzi scheme going. So they got to print, 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 beg, borrow, steal, beg, borrow, steal. And that's why you have a whole host of issues, whole host of tailwinds for gold and silver. So look into it. Look into gold and silver mining stocks. Get diversified. Do your homework. Do what's best for you. Uncle Sam's 10-year Treasury junk note, up a little bit, now yielding 0.63%. We'll see how long live this lasts. And again, like we discussed last week, the distortionary effects are just beginning. There's going to be a lot of false information out there. Uh, stocks, for one, are they pricing in economic growth or are they just pricing in more money printing? What's the bond market doing? Is it going to start pricing in inflation? Is that going to cause yields to rise? Is the Federal Reserve really going to put the pedal to the metal and buy even more, suppressing rates? But that very act of printing more money is, by definition, inflationary. So there are going to be a lot of poor decisions made across the entire spectrum of markets, perhaps even within the precious metal space. Now, I think less likely there because of all of the fundamental reasons, all of those tailwinds behind it. But there are going to be false signals all over the place because of what they're doing. It's, it, now, with another, perhaps, I don't know, $1,200 stimulus check, an extra 200 a week, where's that money going to go? Are people going to save it? Are these Robin Hood day traders going to go out there and just throw it into something? Talk about another wealth transfer. Talk about being another middleman for the upper echelons of the income scale. And I came across an interesting chart today on that, too, when it comes to wealth inequality. Somebody did the research to look at the wealth inequality in France prior to and during the French Revolution and compared it to the United States today. Well, guess what, folks? The wealth inequality, it is worse today here in the United States than it was during the French Revolution. And, of course, that cause, that was a main cause of the French Revolution. Off with their heads, bring out the guillotines. This is history repeating. That's why I can understand what's going on. That's why I can make these observations and say, hey, protests are being coming to a theater near you. Because this has happened before. You know, we can look at the TV and we can see what's going on on the West Coast and the East Coast and we say it's crazy. This has happened before. We just weren't around during the French Revolution. But, of course, there's still a lot of people around who were around during Vietnam in the 60s and the 70s and all those protests and riots, too. But th this is what happens. It all goes back to economics. You can have your cherry-picked soapbox issue that gets you going, abortion, the Second Amendment, liberal judges, conservative judges, what have you, you can have it and that's fine. You can, we can have an honest debate about those things. You can get upset about wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. You can get upset about the monuments and the statues. You can get upset about a can of beans. Get upset for whatever you want. I don't care. But I want you to be focused on the bigger ticket items. Because even if you Solve those things to your liking, you're still going to be taxed at 30, 40, 50 percent when you add it all up across the board. You're still going to have the inflation tax. You're still going to have an out of control, unaccountable central bank. That's why I focus on those things, because then you can really start to solve all of those other issues. But you got to get rid of the Fed and you got to get rid of the income tax. You don't do those two things, you're not going to solve a damn thing. I hope that's starting to sink in and I hope you understand the devastating effects of both of those institutions, the income tax and the central bank. It's just stealing everybody's wealth. That's why you have economic collapse after economic collapse. And this is just getting started. It's the weakest links going first. Venezuela, Argentina, Lebanon, Iran, Turkey. It's coming. It will make its way around. It's not going to be pretty. Believe me when I tell you. Also this week, Starting tomorrow and then concluding on Wednesday is the FOMC meeting, the Federal Open Market Committee of the Federal Reserve. 
making a decision on interest rates and God knows what else. I mean, how many emergency facilities are they implementing and, and managing right now? It's going to be more, more, more. That's why the title of this podcast is A Week of More. We're getting more stimulus, quote-unquote stimulus, from Congress. And, of course, it's going to have to be financed by the Federal Reserve. So at least another trillion, maybe a trillion and a half, maybe two, when the Democrats get down with it and say, okay, well, a trillion got to go to the states and localities, and then we got to get a trillion for unemployment and job training and moratoriums and this, that, and the other. Give me a break. Give me a break. So Jay Powell will come out, and he'll say, we're going to do whatever it takes because that's the motto of the Federal Reserve now. That's what former Chairman Ben Bernanke said last week in testimony before Congress. We talked about that here. That whatever it takes. Jay Powell said it before. They're going to say it again. And the markets are going to love it. Because the stock market doesn't care about economic growth anymore. It will one day, but it doesn't right now. It just wants more cheap, funny money. That's all it wants. Keep it going. Keep it going. And they're going to get it. They're going to get it. We got a Federal Reserve balance sheet of about $7 trillion. Another trillion comes down the pike that we don't have. It's, it's, it's going to be eight, $9 trillion balance sheet before you know it. That takes us to the M2 money stock. I'm looking at a percentage change from a year, over, from a year ago. All right. Sitting at 24.1%. Year over year change, 24.1%. And I say, Alex, I don't know what that means. I'm going to tell you what it means. This is history in the making is what it means. This is a banana republic is what it means. 24.1%. Were we ever even close to that number? Because this data, of course, provided by the Federal Reserve, goes back to 1981, with at least the data I'm looking at here. The highest we ever saw. Year-over-year -year change was back in 1983 at about 13%. About 13%. We are now at 24%. We are through the roof. We are through the roof. And we're not done because the more Uncle Sam needs or wants, and he's going to get it, the worse this is going to get. So just so you understand that, that's M2. They used to have M3, which was the broadest aggregate of the money stock. That would give us the fullest picture available as to what they're doing, at least to a better degree. But they stopped reporting M3 during the great financial crisis because, oh, no, no, we, we can't show this number. We are out of control. We even know it. We can't show the people what we're doing. So they stopped it. So we just get M2. But still, it's something to look at. What else did I want to say? Yes, for perspective, right? A trillion dollars. Just a trillion. Okay, let's forget the three trillion that was borrowed on a net-net basis for the second quarter alone. Let's forget the path of a $4 trillion deficit for this year alone. Let's just focus and assume that the Republicans can hold strong and really keep the Nobody Cares Act round two to $1 trillion. Okay? little perspective. The Mexican economy, Mexican GDP is $1.2 trillion. Indonesia, $1.1 trillion. The Netherlands, $900 billion. Saudi Arabia, $800 billion. Again, GDP. Turkey, $750 billion. Switzerland, $700 billion. Taiwan, $600 billion. Nobody Cares Act, round number two, in itself, would be one of the largest economies in the world. Now, you want to talk about our deficit hitting $4 trillion. You got the United States, number one. You have China, number two. You have the Euro area, number three. You have Japan, number four. Okay? Then you would have our national deficit at $4 trillion, which is larger than Germany at $3.8 trillion. How, how sustainable do you think this is, folks? And not to mention of the other valuations that we talk about here too frequently, 
Fangman, those seven stocks, larger than Japan and Italy combined. Seven companies. I mean, th this is completely out of control. So many people are going to be hurt by this. It's not even funny. It's not even funny. Because the stock market does have some serious implications for the broader economy as to what it does. And they understand this. They understand this, and this is one of the reasons why they're juicing it. They're also juicing it because they're in the club. They're in the club. And again, that club led to the French Revolution. It led to revolutions all over the place. We were taxed too much here. I mean, my God, if the founding fathers knew how much we were taxed today, they said, what, what the hell are you people waiting for? What, what, what sign do you need to see? How much, how, how much more taxation do you need to see? And guess what? That's coming. Higher taxes is coming because you can't pay for all of this with the printing press. This is going to have to be mopped up and paid for with higher taxes. And that's coming down the pike, and that's not going to be a pretty picture either. So many things coming together, no leadership, no honesty. It's just simply a continuation of what we have been doing and hoping that somehow, some way, we're finally going to get it right. That is, by definition, insanity. So we can't be surprised that when you turn the television on, it's one insane video after video after video after another. You can't be surprised by what you're witnessing, is what I'm trying to get across to you. You can't keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. And this is just getting started. So here you have it, folks. A week of more. And it's, it's only, well, it's almost August. It's almost August. If they need to do more, if there's a massive sell-off in the market, ugh, that's just going to be all Congress needs. That's all White House needs. That's all the Federal Reserve needs to even put the pedal even further to the floor than what it already is. I still believe that this week is going to be a volatile week, but we'll see what happens. Stay diversified, stay vigilant, and stay with the Capitol News. I am Alex Caritas. Godspeed.